In a jarring reversal of U.S. foreign policy, the Biden administration seems to openly acknowledge that the war in Ukraine will end with diplomacy and lost territory from Ukraine, and not through total Ukrainian victory. The White House gave the updated policy aim to Politico and argued this had been America's position throughout the conflict. However, as friend of the show Zed Jelani posted on X, arguing Ukraine would have to give up land is something which, if you said it six months ago, made you Putin's right-hand man. The news comes as America's European allies encourage the U.S. to send more military aid while praising aid sent so far. Here's a German government spokesperson saying just that. The U.S. regierung has a further package of military help in the of 250 million U.S. dollars. We have taken that into account and we welcome the further support of the U.S. for Ukraine. Um, what das weitere angeht, um, Da vertrauen wir darauf, dass die USA, wie von Präsident Biden angekündigt, die Ukraine auch weiter unterstützen wird. Also on Ukraine's list of concerns, pension payments. The Financial Times reports that without Western aid, Kiev might have to delay paying wages for 500,000 civil servants and 1.4 million teachers, as well as benefits for 10 million pensioners. Reportedly, the Ukrainian government is racing to cobble together money to pay for public services and benefits after promised funding from its closest allies failed to come through. It needs $37 billion in external support next year. Here to discuss the situation in Ukraine and what the West should do, in front of the show and military expert Daniel Davis, and you can catch his show, Deep Dive, on YouTube. Welcome back once again. Thanks, Robbie. Good to be here. So it's, it's funny that we're arriving, I mean, funny is the wrong word for it. It's, it's uh, yeah. notable that we're arriving at a moment that you long predicted on this very show where the, even the very pro-Ukrainian resistance uh, kind of figures, pundit class, uh, government, military experts are conceding that the only way out of this situation is negotiation and that that negotiation might be painful for Ukraine, but it will you know, not result in the end of the Ukra entire Ukrainian nation. It will just be some kind of cessation of territory. Yeah, <laughs> Robbie, this is really painful to, to be here and now. You know, now we're closing on the two-year mark of this war when we had a deal almost in the bag in, in March, April of 2022, barely a month into the war. The outlines of a negotiated settlement were on the table. Both sides generally agreed to. And then it was sabotaged either by uh, Boris Johnson or, or by the U.S., depending on who you want to believe what actually happened. All we know is that it was absolutely rejected. At that time, Ukraine could have had even Mariupol was still in their control at that time. All these cities that have been wiped out would all have been in their control. And I think I did say on your show a couple of times that the longer this goes, the less territory they have and the worse their negotiated outcome will be. But there will be one because Ukraine didn't have the military capacity to win. That should have been self-evident. But now then, it's, despite all the spin and all the pretending that it was otherwise, now you're left with the reality that's finally sinking in that we're going to have to do a negotiated settlement. And unfortunately, that's going to be on much worse terms for Zelensky than it would have been otherwise. But, but so far, Zelensky still isn't saying he's going to do that. He's still talking about his big plans for 2024. So we, we got a bit of a problem that's going to have to be solved pretty quickly. I understand the U.S. incentive here to, quote, weaken Russia, as they admitted very early on into this conflict. But I do wonder what Zelensky thought the end game of this was going to be. Were there what kind of promises were extended um, behind closed doors or tacitly that made Zelensky and Ukrainians feel like this was a proxy war that would ultimately benefit them when the reality of Russia being a nuclear power with a military that could not be defeated by Ukraine alone, and with the United States having understandable reluctance to engage in World War III in a direct conflict with another nuclear power. I mean, what on earth could possibly have been on the minds of Ukrainians as a potential endgame here that's better than what we're seeing now? Now, it's really hard for me to improve on what you just said. That, you, that one dialogue there, you really laid out the whole thing in pretty stark, clear language. Uh, historians are going to have to tell us what was actually being said behind the scenes at various points. Uh, we can't know that for sure. But I, I think that probably the biggest issue is that Zelensky and many in the West, and I'm talking some retired three- and four-star U.S. generals, frankly, who have been feeding this narrative, 
that they've been thinking with their heart and and not with their mind. And and look, I get it. Their country was invaded. I mean, there, there's every reason for them to hate the Russians and to hate what was done and to want to reverse it. That's that's clear and uh, and uh, unquestioned. But you also have to have the reality involved here. It doesn't matter what you want. It matters what you can do and what's reasonable and what's probable. And and the the military balance has been going in Russia's favor. Has been in Russia's favor since. February 2024, uh, 22, even when they made these horrible, egregious mistakes in the first nine months of war, they're big enough to overcome those mistakes. Ukraine is not. And now that they've lost an entire generation of men, men they're going to need uh, to to recover their country and to move back into the future. And they've got to stop the bleeding right now. And ending the war on negotiated settlement is the absolute best they can get at this point. And I'm telling you, if they don't d- agree to it now, we're going to lose even more territory before it's all over. Let's say your perspective was, uh, from an American foreign policy perspective, Russia is a is a foe, a geopolitical foe. Um, yeah, Ukraine is not going to defeat Russia, but we want to make Russia hurt. We want to punish them for having done this. So we'll, you know, we'll send some money, some arms to Ukraine. It's their people dying in this effort, not ours. And even if it's not going to work out, let's say the goal is just to punish Russia, to hurt them a little bit, maybe a lot for as long as we conceivably can, and now that's all over. From that perspective, how much damage did this actually inflict on Russia economically, militarily, et cetera? Robbie, if we had ended this war at about the one-year mark, uh, or even at the, the, in the, the February or March-April period of 2022, as I mentioned a minute ago, Russia would have been harmed. They would have been significantly damaged. But because we didn't end it, now that Russia has their industry cranking on all cylinders, they're producing new weapons of war that they didn't even have before. They have burned off all of this chaff that they had at the beginning that were these terrible leaders that they had. Now that they have experienced leaders in, in large scale operations, they're now getting stronger than they were prior to February, not mm-hmm. weaker. So, again, the longer we go, the worse for our own uh, interest are. Because Russia is going to be stronger conventionally afterwards. So we need to turn this off quickly before they get even stronger. Lieutenant Colonel, thank you so much as always for joining us today. Thanks a lot.